The 30th president of the United States, Calvin Coolidge, had a reputation that most politicians just don't have. He didn't like to make speeches. In fact, his reticence earned him the nickname Silent Cal. A story which is told about him said that one day he went to church, and when he returned to the White House, his wife asked him, How was church? Fine. Was the preacher good? Yes. What was his sermon about? Sin. What did he say about it? He was against it. Somehow that describes a lot of what we do at the same time. And for many people, they share Coolidge's opinion of sin. The best way, the best thing they can muster is they're just against it. But is that enough? Mankind has always struggled with the dilemma, a Gordian knot that can't be untied. How do you live for God, walk in the light, but deal with the human failings we all have? Do we just go ahead and sin and hope for the best? Do we live in a state of constant despair? Do we act like we do diets where we have really great intentions, but then somebody puts the chocolate cake out, we have a piece, and we begin to believe, oh, well, if I've already eaten one, I can just eat all of it, and you consume the whole thing. Is that what you do with sin? You sin once, so you just keep doing it because it doesn't make any difference? Does God have unrealistic standards that none of us can meet, and therefore Christianity is a cruel system designed to pull hope out from underneath us? And yet John tells us about how a holy God deals with unholy sin, but in a way that gives us good reason not to do as we please. At the end of the first chapter of 1 John, John gives a comforting picture. We saw it last week. John, 1 John chapter 1, 7 to 9, he says, If we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And if we claim that we are without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, I think the key phrase comes in verse 7. He cleanses us. He purifies us. And that present tense says it's a constant cleaning from sin. But now we're faced with a problem. If we're constantly experiencing sin's cleansing, do we take it seriously? After all, out of sight usually is out of mind. You might be tempted to quit being concerned because you become unaware of it. So John paints us into this corner, but we all feel it anyway. We make sins, we can make sin very severe. That's what Jonathan Edwards did. He was the Puritan preacher. And he voiced the view of many of his time towards sin. In his sermon, The Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, the Almighty scowls in delight as he dangles sinners over the fires of hell, waiting for them to drop to their damnation. But then there are others who swing to the other extreme. They're so lenient with sin that they just say, well, it happens. Don't worry about it. That's kind of what happened in Romans chapter 6. Paul records there what some people, I think, were saying. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? Now, Paul says in no, by no means. But if you think about the thinking that goes behind that, there are some that saw God's grace as a license to sin. You sin more, and you let God love more. And so the way you let God shower his grace upon you is to present him with even greater opportunities to forgive. And somehow that makes God an ethereal grandfather patting his children on the head, saying, well, boys will be boys. And that's when sin loses its edge. It's almost like a dog with a shock collar. He keeps hitting the barrier and keeps shocking him. But after a while, he's so used to it, he never feels it anymore. But that's not John's purpose. He doesn't want a soft pedal sin, but he also doesn't want to take a hard swing at Christians who struggle with it. John opens the second chapter by telling us what his desire is for Christians everywhere. He writes the tender, caring shepherd who cares for those who are walking in the light. Verse 1 says, My dear children, I write to you so that you will not sin. Listen to the words, the tenderness. Dear children, he wants only what is best for them. And he knows what is best. He writes so that you will not sin. And so as a caring shepherd, he wants to 
prevent the sin in their lives. But John is also a realist. He knows what God wants and also what man is capable of. Man can't achieve perfection. And the letter of 1 John is written and it gives instructions to steer Christians on how to walk in the light as he is in the light. That much is clear. But then John remembers the pinch we're all in. We're spiritual beings in fleshly bodies. He doesn't want Christians to fall into the trap of the false teachers because they either deny sin or they engorge their lives with sinful behavior. But John wants neither. He doesn't want to be too lenient and therefore condone sin. But neither does he want to be so severe that he condemns us to hopelessness. Instead, John sees us clearly. He knows we are human. That's the reality we all have to deal with in our lives. And so he finishes the first verse by saying, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. If anyone does sin, the way John frames the words makes it clear he's not talking about living in a state of sin. It's not the libertine who throws caution to the wind that John is advising here. But he does say that people commit sins, single acts, things they confess, things they repent of. He makes a very clear distinction between license and grace, which is hard for most moderns to make. John simply recognizes a spiritual truth made clear by Paul in the Roman letter in Romans 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When Paul writes that, he puts sin both in past and present term. We have sinned in the past and we will continue to miss the mark of God's glory. And knowing it is a problem, though, doesn't address it completely. You can go to a doctor with an ailment and it says, my that's interesting. But you leave and you don't feel any better. Why not? Nothing has told you that will help you get to be a better. Something needs to be said so you can see the seriousness of sin. We don't overlook sins because there are steps required to bring about the forgiveness. Difficult steps. Not for us, but for God. So he throws open a curtain to let us see what's taking place in heaven. And for John, that clear picture of sin's demands comes in the first two verses. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the entire world. Those two verses... When you put them together, picture the great, terrible price that sin extracts in our lives. It requires something, two very strong measures, something we cannot do for ourselves. First, it requires an advocate. John says, if someone does sin, we have an advocate. Now, that's a word with uh, many colored threads that can comprise the material. We usually run across this when we read John 14. John 14, Jesus is telling the disciples he is going to leave. He's about to be crucified. He's going to heaven. He says, I'm going to leave you, but I won't leave you bereft. He said, I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Now, the Greek word he uses for advocate there is the word paraclete. And in John 14, it refers to the Holy Spirit, but Understand the, the word paraclete is a, a word of function. It's not a title. It's not a position. It's a function. It really means to come alongside as a helper. And you can see that in a lot of different contexts. Genesis 37. Jacob holds a bloody coat in his hands. It's a coat he had made and given to his son Joseph. As he stares at it with tears brimming in his eyes. He just knows that Joseph has been torn apart by a lion or a bear. Standing there, Joseph's brothers, quiet as church mice, hoping their guilt won't show. At that moment in his grief, people come around Jacob. They throw their arms around him to console him. In the Greek version of the Old Testament, called the Septuagint, the word 
used for the comfort and the comforters is paraclete. They comfort the hurting. But listen to how it's used in another place, in a similar way. But in Matthew chapter 4, 5 and verse 4, we've never seen it because we never talk about it. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. There in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uses that word paraclete in just the position to mourning. It is the comforting of grief. Now, while that sounds normal to us, this passage doesn't seem to take on that flavor. So what does it mean for John in the passage we're looking at today? Why do we need an advocate? Well, it's a common Greek term because the legal systems of the day were confusing. And it required someone who was recognized and trusted by judges to represent someone's case. Today, we call that person an attorney. Now, I don't know if you've ever faced legal actions or not, but at least on two occasions in my ministry, the churches I've served faced lawsuits. And it didn't take me long to realize I was way out of my element. The waters were deep and I couldn't swim in them. However, the good thing is I had friends who represented the church and myself. They knew the system. They knew how it, did, how it worked. They knew how to deal with it. It's in those kinds of situations where we have no power and no control, and we need somebody to plead our case. We need an advocate. After all, the adage does say that a man who represents himself has a fool for a client. In the spiritual courts, that's even worse. There's a reason we need an advocate. We've been accused. In the final book of the New Testament, John writes to Revelation. In it, he portrays the, the scenes behind the scenes, if you will. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10 is a mixture of a glorious passage, but gives us the seed of what's really happening in heaven. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and power and kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of my brothers and sisters, who accuses them before God day and night, have been hurled down. Listen, there's an accuser, he said. The accuser is the devil who lays claim to souls because of their sin. It's a fight with God. That's why you need an advocate. John tells us we have an advocate who takes on the accuser in the heavenly courts. And he names the advocate. It's Jesus Christ, the righteous one. His character is given. The righteous one. None of us can be called that. The one who stands before God representing us has the credentials of complete righteousness. And that gives him the right and the ability to stand in the purity of the throne of God and plead our case before heaven's bar. The Hebrew writer captures the same kind of idea. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says, Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has ascended into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. You hear the righteousness come out in that passage. And the Hebrew writer calls him a high priest in, in Latin, which was quickly becoming the language of culture and the legalities of, of the Roman world. The word priest literally meant bridge builder. If you take these thoughts and put them all together, you realize that Jesus has the character and the nature to bridge the gap that our sin creates to argue our case with the eternal judge. But there's a second concept that makes us think seriously about sin. That is that sin required payment. Verse 2, John goes on to say, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not only ours, but for also for the sins of the whole world. In this text, we read it, and the, the translation that is used here, the New International, tries to explain a difficult term by using a translation called atoning sacrifices. 
Other versions, such as the King James Version, uses the word propitiation. Now, that's not a word we throw around the water cooler conversations or drop into our Facebook posts. We never say, I had to go propitiate that speeding ticket. Instead, we reduce a difficult concept into one we can understand. It has to do with the concept of atonement, of making things right. When damage occurs, someone is expected to pay the person who creates the damage. You either pay with money or in some other form of restitution. And as long as the debt is outstanding, there's always going to be difference between parties. First, if you had a friend who happened to hit your car and they got out and said, don't worry, I am going to take care of it. I will pay for it. It's my insurance company will, will take care of it. Don't worry about it. But the days drag into weeks, it's drag into months, and nothing happens. Every time you go out, you see that dent in your car, and you grind your teeth at it. And one day, you see them again. Now, how does that affect your relationship with that person? Is it tense? Is it a little bit frayed? See, that's the problem that, that sin creates with God. It creates that deficit. It creates the problem. So when damage occurs in the theological and moral realm, the same concept applies, except it's not currency that we're talking about. It's not physical. But it does mean that something of value has to be given to make up for the transgressions. That's the idea behind the mosaical law. Numbers chapter 5 and verse 8 it says, if a person has no close relatives to whom restitution can be made, the restitution belongs to the Lord and must be given to the priest along with the ram, which is the atonement that is made the wrongdoer. You have these terms, the restitution, the atonement, all play into the fact of propitiation, something that closes the gap, something that makes amends for the wrong that's been done. I think it's probably best seen in a charming little story found in first set. Samuel chapter 25. In that story, there's a man named Nabal. His name means fool, which is a really apt name if you read the story. And he rejects David's request for supplies after David protects Nabal's shepherds without pay. In essence, he said, I scratched your back. Now, can you just scratch mine? And David's not really out of bounds by asking for that. It's the prudent and kind thing to do. But when David hears of Nabal's defiant insults of him and his men, he straps on his weapons, and he's out to get vengeance. He wants to draw blood. He wants Nabal to pay for what he did. But Nabal has an astute wife named Abigail. I never understood how he got Abigail. It must have been an arranged marriage because she wouldn't have, she wouldn't have married this man on her own. But she realized the coming distress, and so she takes food and delicacies and rides off and she meets David before he ever gets there. And she brings it to him and she softens him because she wants to present, prevent the slaughter, even though her husband really did deserve it. And that act takes the heat out of David and he relents. In short, Abigail made propitiation. She atoned for the sins of someone else. It is that background in which propitiation comes. It is the placating of the anger, in this case, the anger of God. Now, some would protest, I couldn't worship God who gets so hot-headed and irritated with smallest infractions. Now, before you jump to that conclusion, that was the Greeks and Romans' ideas. They had deities that had human emotions, and they'd get ticked, and they'd throw thunderbolts and lightning rods at people. But that's not how God deals with it. He doesn't have human emotions. This is not describing an emotional response of God of getting upset and angry at us like we would do with someone. Instead, it describes more the violation of the holiness. When we sin, we open a chasm between us and God because we cannot come into God's holiness and stand in his nature. That's the anger of God. He has to separate himself from us because the sin demands it. So what John says is not only does Jesus represent us before God,
but he presents himself for the payment of our own offenses, even though he doesn't owe it. He does it to free us in the entire world. We sin, and God pays his own debt with what was most valuable to him, his own son. Now, that doesn't sound reasonable, but it does sound godly. So if you listen to what John says, sin is so serious because it takes God in his own extreme measures that cost himself greatly to deal with the sins of those of us who seek forgiveness and want to follow him. And it's not to be taken lightly. What God has had to do is several things that help us but take him. In short, John says sin makes us helpless. We can't ignore it, and we can't think of ourselves as hopeless and just give in to it. Instead, he wants to remind us that someone else, that God himself, paid a high price for our behalf. That's how serious sin is. That problem, we live in a bootstrapping society where we really believe we can do everything by ourselves. I can pay my own debts. I can take care of my own problems. But sorry, when it comes to sin, we're absolutely helpless. We're like penniless prisoners headed to the gallows being hammered together outside of our window. Now, we usually connect the cleansing of sin with the act of baptism that washes away sin. But John takes it a step further. He says that we're talking about life after baptism. It is the life in the light we're talking about. And while we're doing that, we still continue to sin, not because we want to, but because of our nature. And God is, has established the ways to constantly purify us from sin. God takes those big steps for us. That's how, sin's, how serious sin is. We confess, but the words have to be backed up by something. Else they're just idle syllables looking for meaning. And without the continuing work of Christ, Sin will overwhelm us every time. And then where we turn. That's how sin, serious sin is. That God took extraordinary steps to deal with our own problems in ways that could draw him, draw us to him. And we all need someone to rescue us. Wells Crowther was always wearing a red bandana. He had it with him all the time when he was a boy. His father told him the, the folded white ones in your pocket were for showing, but the red ones were for blowing. And he took him everywhere, even when he joined uh, the Empire Hook and Ladder Company as a fireman when he was 16. He tied it around his hat and it wore it under his helmet. He grew up a little more and he went on to college at Boston College where he became an equities trader. The office of his firm was located in a very prestigious spot of New York, on the 104th floor of the South Tower of the World Trade Center. He was at work when United Flight 175 crashed and exploded 15 floors beneath him. On those lower floors were people. One was a woman named Lin Yung, who was blown back against a desk and dazed in the explosion. She tried to see, but she couldn't because blood smeared her glasses. When she wiped them clean, all she could see were bodies and the swirling debris and dust around her. She struggled to her feet and headed toward the door, hoping to find a way out, but really not believing she could. It was there in that stairwell that she met Wells. He had his red bandana around his face. And he took her by the hand and led her and dozens of others down 17 flights of stairs to the elevators that still worked at that time. But Wells, still wearing his red bandana, headed back up the stairwell. Somewhere in that rubble, he found Judy Wine. She struggled to walk because her ribs were broken, her arm was broken, her lung was punctured. So he put her, his, her arm around his shoulders and he took her back down to the waiting firefighters. But again, 
he refused to stay. And he went back up again. That was the last time anyone saw Wells. Six months later, as the last of the rubble of the World Trade Center was being cleared from ground zero, under a rock, someone found a red bandana. This 24-year-old saved dozens of lives on a very terrible day. Lynn keeps his photo in her apartment. She says, without him, I wouldn't be here. He saved my life. He will always be in my heart, always be with me. Today, the image of sacrifice is in the 9-11 Museum under glass. A simple red bandana, a symbol of a life given for others. And we always consider that serious. Perhaps we should stop before we act. And remember the great price that God pays to keep us forgiven so that we can be cleansed constantly, purged of our sins. And remember that when it does happen, God has placed an advocate in heaven who can argue our case because he has already paid our price. Thank you for joining me today. I'll see you again next Sunday.